Nope. There is something about the deserts of the American Southwest that denies all explanation. The deserts aren't dead things, wastelands waiting to consume the living. They themselves live and thrum. They vibrate with energy and life. They are beautiful and brutal in equal amounts, the one making the other more poignant. Those deserts are also filled with their own secrets. Voices on empty mesas, footprints in dead stone, bones dancing to their own rattles. A person doesn't have to lose their mind out there to think they're going crazy. The desert protects itself. I was 24 back in 1996 when I first ventured out into Monument Valley, accompanied by a res dog named Pinto I'd found in Kianta. I'd started my morning in Flagstaff, Arizona, and made my way upwards towards Tuba City, some light backpacking gear and journals tucked securely in my back seat. I'd lived in Arizona all my life, but never made my way through the Navajo Nation to go see the valley. With a career move looming, I decided I had to go before I left Arizona behind for the foreseeable future. I pulled into Kayanta at about 10.30 a.m. and stocked up on a few food essentials at the Bashas, a grocery store that only seems to exist on reservations. I met Pinto in the cracked parking lot while loading the food into a small cooler. He was kind of a mutt, a smaller lab, and red-brown in color like a Pinto bean, thus the name. He stared longingly at the salami I was hiding away and licked his lips as I pulled it back out. Despite being a stray, he sat politely a few feet away as I withdrew a piece and placed it on the ground in front of him. He waited for a moment for me to pull my hand back and then gingerly took it, his brown eyes on me as he ate. With the first piece done, he came even closer, his boldness multiplied by his hunger. I wondered if it was a mistake to feed him until he touched his nose to my hand and pushed it back towards the cooler. Smart dog. This time I gave him a small piece of yellow cheese, the gross kind that comes wrapped in individual plastic sleeves. This time he didn't wait for me to put it on the ground, gleefully grabbing it from my fingers and devouring it. He stood and stretched into a low play bow, thanking me and then jumping into the back seat next to the cooler before I could stop him. The next few minutes were spent trying to coax him out of the car. I tried more salami and cheese, but he seemed to know the game and stayed put, curling up in the legroom of the back seat. Anytime I tried to touch him, he'd shy away or snarl slightly. Eventually, I gave up and relented. It wasn't like he belonged to anyone in Kianta anyway. I wouldn't be the first white boy to take a res dog home. Together, we drove north towards Monument Valley. He started the drive by staying in his little puppy ball. But after the first half hour, he came and sat in the passenger seat. He looked out of the window ahead of us and watched the world slide by, his pink tongue lolling out as he panted the heat away. Now that I wasn't trying to remove him from the car, he was happy to have my hand scratch at his dusty fur. We drove that way for a while, one hand scratching behind his ear, one hand on the wheel, keeping him sentinel. I pulled the backcountry camping permit I had gotten earlier and placed it on my dashboard. 
Monument Valley is sacred to the Navajo, and I wanted to be sure I showed at least a bit of respect for them. We drove as far as the dirt road would take us, parked, and sat a while as I journaled and drew. The towering giants of red-orange stone stood stark against the gigantic blue sky. I wrote that the monuments looked like gravestones, something I'm sure no one had ever thought before. Sometimes the brain wasn't as creative as I wanted it to be. At first, Pinto refused to leave the car, content with his wheel well. I left the back door open for him and went to the front passenger seat to write. Soon, however, he laid down next to the car in the shade and slept while I worked. I poured some water into a small Tupperware for him and left it next to him. He'd sometimes wake to take lazy slurps before stretching back out and relaxing. The Arizona sun beat down, but the temperature was only in the mid-70s, a perk of traveling in October. After I was done writing and working, I began to head out on the trail with a light pack, planning to sleep in the car for the first night. Pinto watched me leave, not yet interested in joining the exploration. I was a bit bummed that he had come this far and then decided to let me go, but I had just met him. As I walked down the trail, I stared out across the world. Bright white clouds hung suspended in blue, seeming to hardly move at all. Hard dust and stone crunched and slid below my feet as I walked. The world was quiet around me, and visibility was good in all directions. Lizards lazed about on rocks, sunning themselves until I passed close to them, their small sounds of escape echoing mine as they skittered away. I spent much of my youth in the deserts down south near Phoenix, but this was a new kind of solitude. After just a few short hours, I began to hear my own footsteps as if they were echoes. Sometimes I'd hear the shifting of dirt, but couldn't see what caused it. As the sun reached a midway point on the horizon, I decided to stop and sit for a while before turning back to the car. I had been approaching one of the largest spires for the last few hours, but the size was deceptive. I knew there was a designated campsite somewhere closer to the monument, but I wouldn't get there until tomorrow. I pulled out a hunk of bread from the smaller pack I'd brought with me that day and dug in. I thought of all the stories I'd heard about the desert, all of the ghost stories that desert dwellers knew, the stories even rational people would tell. As a child, I had let my imagination get the best of me time and again. I would see and hear the things I was afraid of, but I'd mostly grown out of that. However, being out here alone was eerily disconcerting. I'd grown my false footsteps into footsteps of their own. Several times while relaxing out on the trail, I thought I heard those footsteps again, and I'd look around, but there was obviously nothing there just my imagination. When I began to head back to the car, the echoed footsteps seemed to begin again, closer. I walked more quickly, but tried to calm myself to avoid letting my imagination grow wild. A small mistake in the desert, even on a trail and with gear, could be deadly. As the world turned to dark, I crested the last rise and found myself standing again in the parking lot, Pinto wagging his tail as he saw me. And then his hackles raised as he looked at me and began to growl. I stopped in my tracks, unsure what was going on, until suddenly the scent of rotting flesh hit my nose. It was as if I had stepped into a slaughterhouse. 
Then I noticed the sound of my footsteps. Not my footsteps. The footsteps behind my footsteps. Inside my footsteps. I turned and finally caught a glimpse of something incredibly tall and spindly stalking up behind me, its caution lost now that it had been spotted. The flashes of skin touched by moonlight were bone white, while the rest of it was covered in matted fur and blood. I bolted for the car and noticed the back driver's side door was open. I'd forgot to close it after Pinto had first refused to get out. As I ran, Pinto ran past me, screaming his growling bark into the night. I heard the thing that had been following my steps cry and then crash away into the night, the small dog barking after it. I got into my car and confirmed my initial fear. The dome light above me was off. The car was dead. Futilely, I tried to get the engine to turn over. It refused. I couldn't go back into the night with that thing out there. So I sat with the doors closed and locked, a sleeping bag wrapped around me, trying to preserve my heat as the temperatures outside plummeted. I worried about Pinto for a while before my exhaustion caught up with me. I fell into an uneasy sleep as the moon shed just enough light to see into the distance of the valley. Thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed this week's video. If you did, you know what to do. Smash that like button down below, leave a comment, share it with Brett. This was part one of what's going to be a three-part series uh, that's going to be posted uh, every Tuesday for the rest of April. Uh, shout out to the author, Reddit user, A Moon Walked. That is A Moon Walked. I will leave a link down below to their Reddit profile as well as a link to the story. If you just have to read ahead and know how it ends, I don't blame you. But if you do and you come back, and you decide to leave a spoiler, I'm going to ban you from the channel. You've been warned. So until next week, everybody, remember to stay safe out there. I'll be seeing you in the next video.